So the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also has conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Please be seated. Thank you very much, Blair. Yes, children's church can be dismissed. I was really blessed by the worship this morning. It was very lovely. Uh, It's so good to come and to stand before our God and be able to give him the praise due his name. Uh, Our God is absolutely, positively sovereign. He determines everything that shall come to pass. And as this portion of scripture that we're in, in Romans chapter 9 now, it's again a very difficult portion of scripture. It's a portion of scripture that we have to approach with um, humility, recognizing that we couldn't understand nothing of God if it weren't for him, and that we would not know God if it weren't for his sovereign electing love that he places on those that are his. So, but the the point here is, in this portion of scripture, and why I think God allows us to see these very deep and difficult truths is to demonstrate the vast difference between an infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing God and finite man. That's demonstrated in election. So today, Paul will settle the argument and declare very clearly that God sovereignly elects. And in the next couple weeks, we're going to deal with the fallout from that because there are natural complaints and struggles that come from a God who elects, not just those that he loves and saves, but a God who passes over and also those who are reprobate are so in turn elected or chosen in a way. It's going to be difficult to look at, but what, again, it is that that makes this what it is is because of that great distance between God and man. Uh, Charles Hodge, Hodge states what we will find after considering sovereign election. There's nothing in the exercise of this sovereignty inconsistent with either justice or mercy, God only punishes the wicked for their sins while he extends undeserved mercy to the objects of his grace. There is no injustice done to one wicked man in the pardon of another, especially as there are the highest objects to be accomplished both in the punishment of the vessels of wrath in the pardon of the vessels of mercy. God does nothing more than exercise a right inherent in sovereignty. It's his good right and pleasure to have mercy on whom he would have mercy and on whom he wills to not have mercy. Uh, Again, I I think of R.C. Sproul just, just welling up in my heart and head. Nobody is going to get injustice. Some are going to get what they don't deserve. They're going to get mercy. Some are going to get what they rightly deserve, which is justice. 
Um, and again, John kind of brought to my attention after last week, I've been talking a lot and saying this fancy word telos, which means the end or purpose or goal. Telos is an ancient Greek term for an end, fulfillment, completion, goal, or aim. It's the source, again, of this modern word, teleology. It's not that I'm just trying to sound academic. <laughs> it's that what Paul has been teaching us is that God has determined the beginning from the end. And he has foreknown, he has planned, he has purposed and decreed what will occur in all of time and space. Not just about creation, fall, and recreation of his cosmos, but also about who are his and who are not his. Who he will choose and he will who he will pass over. Romans uh, 8.28 and following talks about this wonderful idea that we looked at that God is in control and everything is working together according to his purposes from foreknowledge before the time and space to predestination to sanctification being conformed to the image of the son to uh, justification and, and all of it together and glorification I might got some of that mixed up uh, sanctification after justification but all of it is a work of God and it's all working according to his purpose according to his plans, which is difficult for us because we just can't put that in our little heads. Um, but God reveals this to us. I think about Deuteronomy that says the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. So we have to press into this. Like I said, the first time I preached through Romans 9 through 11, a lot of pastors go, uh, you know, from chapter 8, open up your Bibles to chapter 12. I mean, it really happens. It's a difficult portion of scripture, but I trust that God will help us to be able to look in here and to be able to understand he is absolutely sovereign in election. And what we're gonna see here is that Paul is going to give us uh, a three generations look at election, starting with Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And this election of these men and their descendants, as it were, is going to give us a very firm picture of what election looks like. James Montgomery says this, uh, what is really difficult is that these chapters, particularly chapter nine, also deal with the negative counterpart of election, the doctrine of reprobation, the passing over of those who are not elected to salvation, and that they are written to prove that God is right in doing so. Election is an inescapable fact of human history. But it's good. <laughs> and it really reveals God's all-powerful sovereignty in all of time and space. When we were looking in Romans chapter 8, we found incredible encouragement in knowing that it's God. It's God that calls us. It's God that, that justifies us. It's God who sanctifies, who, who, who glorifies us, that, that he's at work, that it's not us. Because if it depended upon us, nothing would happen. So again, this week, uh, this week I think folks sadly might produce more questions than answers but we have got to press in to this deep, difficult concept of God's election, not just of those that might be saved, of those that who have been passed over for, for, uh, as reprobates. Uh, right there, as you're, you keep your copy of God's word open, and, and maybe as I'm, I'm gonna just say a quick prayer here, because this is difficult stuff, that God might help me to humbly approach his word, and that he might open our hearts. Father God, we thank you for your revelation to us in your word. Father God, we thank you for your great love and kindness to us in Christ. I thank you for those of us that stand here today that have passed from death to life. This is a sovereign work of your loving election and foreknowledge of us before time and space existed. Father God, as we look at this very difficult concept and seeing how you are all powerful and sovereign in election, Lord, I pray you'd help us to have an understanding of this difficult doctrine that our vision of you might be the vision that scripture lays out. That where we've had a narrow and insufficient view of your greatness, I pray, Father, we might see 
your all-powerful hand in time and in space. I pray this in Jesus' name. Help me, Lord. Amen. So we want to start right off at Romans chapter 9, 6. And you'll remember that last week we saw that Paul was explaining how he had deep sorrow, continual grief in his heart for those that were his kinsmen, those who were Israelites. Because by and far, his people, first century Israel, rejected Christ. Not only did they reject Christ, they were the main hand in crucifying Christ. Paul would have known this because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was um, a persecutor of the church, like much of his modern day brethren. But you see that he had incredible sorrow for them. And then he went forward to lay forth all of the great privileges that are those for Israel, from the adoption through the law, the covenants, the service of God, and then again that of whom are the fathers, and through those fathers, and when he speaks mainly about fathers, he's looking back, like I said last week, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, who he's going to look very closely into here. The idea is this, that the word of God is right. It's man that struggles. <laughs> it's not that everything they were told from Genesis on shouldn't have pointed to Christ and shouldn't have caused them to be those that would trust him, but it's that they weren't elect. It's that their hearts were hardened. We'll see that, um, that, that that was their problem. So, so the thing is, the word of God is not wrong. It's man. Uh, so again, it's, he says there, but it is not the word of God that has taken non-effect. Reminds me back to when Paul said in Romans 3, 1 to 4, what advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For if some did not believe, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Of course not. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar. So the word of God is true and steadfast. It's a matter of election. So as I look at this portion here, I want to recognize, and when we talk about election, election and the sovereignty of God, you have to hold them like this with the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God. It's a difficult conversation. But you cannot mitigate one nor the other. And Paul is going to be going to great lengths to explain the sovereignty of God in election. And the other part I want to explain to you here as we look at this is that it's, this is all about Israel. It is about those that are of the line and the lineage of Abraham, those that were born in that first century. He's speaking and dealing with them, but of course there's a lot we can learn that's still applicable to us in our time, in our space. So I wanna look at children of promise, purpose of God in election, and then finally double predestination. So first and foremost, you'll notice here, if you've got your Bible open, in verses 6 through 7, it says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. And what very much is happening here is you're going to see he's talking about all of Israel, all of the Israelites, those that are of the sea, those in that first century that were in the line of Abraham. But he's saying not everybody who is of the nationality of the, 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 the Israelite uh, family uh, or countrymen are true Israel. That, that there are those that are just Israel because they're born into it. It's like, I think for us, it'd be like nominal Christianity. You're born into a church family and you go to church. A lot of those folks were born in being Jews and it was more a nationality than it was faith or trust as we found. They were more proud of who they were as Israelites and that Abraham was their father. So when they were faced with this Christ who is actually the telos of all of scripture, they rejected him. So what Paul is saying here and what we're going to need to hold as we look at all of Romans 9 through 11, not all of Israel. Think about a big graph with all of Israel. You've got all the people of Israel. Within that is a subgroup of true Israel. Not all Israel are Israel, but there are those in Israel that were truly 
promise, the children of promise, and they happen to have both. So this idea that, that they are not all Israel, that are Israel, we're going to learn a lot more about that. But Paul here is making it clear that physical descendants of, of Abraham does not secure one's salvation. The, the all of people of Israel there are not true Israel. And maybe let me just quote uh, John Murray that puts it this way, which is exactly what I just tried to say. The thought is that there is an Israel within ethnic Israel. The Israel distinguished from the Israel of natural descent is the true Israel. The proposition to be demonstrated is that natural descendant does not make children in the sense of true children, children to whom the promise belongs. It is more than just physical descent. And then he goes further to say, but it's in Isaac that your seed shall be called. Now, you have to remember, he's dealing with this first generation, the generation who was Abraham. Abraham was not chosen because he was something or someone. It was because God chose him. What make, made Abraham special is God made a clear call to him. Before God called him, he was a pagan living in, in uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, Babylon, as it were, ancient Babylon. But what made him special is God called him. God made a promise to him. It was Abraham and Sarai, and he made this promise. But what was really interesting about this promise to Abraham, to Abraham, Abraham at that time is that she was barren. <laughs> Sarai could not have children. So this is quite a promise for God to make to him, considering he has no seed. He said all the earth is going to be blessed through your seed. And God made a unilateral promise with Abraham to carry this out in covenant, I believe in Genesis 15. But what ended up happening in this generation is that they sinned. <laughs> they tried to help God along in chapter 16. And Sarai says this to Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children from her. Hagar did not have a son. Hagar then did have a son named uh, Ishmael when Abraham was 86 years old. So actually Ishmael was the son of Abraham. He was a son of Abraham, but by uh, an Egyptian bond woman. So, so they're trying to help there. We know, and I think Israel would have been very easy to see that that, that wasn't going to be the seed. They could sort that pretty easily. But God would later, of course, come. This was going to be a child of promise. This child that would come from, from uh Sarai and Abraham, with their names being changed to Abraham and Sarah, would be Isaac. And he would be a true miracle. It wasn't just that she was barren, but it was waiting until she was 90 and he was 99 that God said, okay, this is it. Now you're going to have this son. So this is the lineage. And, he, and the point of it is there that he was a child of promise um, and, and quite a miracle child. So now look at verse, uh, at verse 8. My one iPad's trying to make beliefs, make Siri at, act out. Okay, quiet down, Siri. All right, so now look at verses nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 8. The whole purpose of this, again, is that it is those that are the children of flesh. These are not the children of God, but it's the children of promise who are counted as the seed. Isaac indeed was that child of promise. It says then, at this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. This was the promised son in the seed who Isaac was. Uh, and, 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 and this is, again, the covenant that God had made with him, that through this miraculous child, there would be this promise. So now you'll see that the modern day Israelites then, they would have seen and had a lot of pride through Isaac. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce says this, there's something else in this example. Again, you have to recognize where where Paul is, is referring to these three generations of Abraham, you have to look at those Old Testament stories. The Ishmael comes into it, who Isaac was, and now we're going to move to Isaac and Rebekah. And so you got Jacob, excuse me, you've got Abraham, 
You've got Isaac, and then you're going to have Jacob. But this is what James Montgomery Boyce says. There's something else in this example. The contrast between natural in the phrase natural children and children of promise. That contrast, plus the quotation from Genesis 18, 10, 14 in verse 9, shows that the difference between Isaac and Ishmael was not merely that God elected Isaac and passed over the other son, but also that the choice of God involved a supernatural intervention in the case of Isaac's conception. Ishmael was born of Abraham's natural powers, but Isaac was conceived with Abraham was conceived when Abraham was past the age of engendering children and Sarah past the age of conceiving and completely being barren. But the point there is that this is the child and this is the child of promise. So now let's jump forward to those folks in first century Israel. They would still again have a great pride in Abraham, that they were the tribe and the blood of Abraham. And I remember when John the Baptist in scripture goes forth to preach the gospel, you remember he says to those folks, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And in this little side note of what we're going to be looking at here in first century Israel is that they're going to be judged because they rejected the Savior. Like I said last week, you look at uh, Matthew chapter 23, there's a lot of, 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 sp of talk about judgment was coming in their day and in their time. Somewhere in Luke it says, these are the days of vengeance in which all things written shall be fulfilled. There, there's, there's this context of, of this being spoken to that first century uh, audience and what is God's plans and purposes with them. It's very much going to be something we're going to deal with very closely as we look at it. But these folks were hard-hearted. They rejected the Lord and Savior. And the point of it is, they missed it. They weren't the children of promise. Even though they were the physical lineage of Isaac. And I think, though, for us here in in 21st century, is that what we are now? <laughs> Christian context? Not all those that are in the church are of the church. There is a visible church and there is an invisible church. Then there was a visible Israel and there was a remnant that was the invisible Israel. And so the warning there for us is, again, we know there's nothing we can do to, to elicit our salvation, but we ought to know that it doesn't get you in. I think of our young ones. Just being in a Christian family doesn't do anything. You also have to hear the gospel, respond to the gospel. Again, God's sovereignty to give the gospel and to make the call. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. And then we are going to be responsible to respond to that. Just like first century Israel was responsible for rejecting Christ. We're responsible for crucifying Christ. So uh, that there I think is enough said. Um, yeah, so here it is. It's the same with our spiritual conception and new birth, which is the inevitable outworking of God's electing choice and is likewise supernatural. We cannot engender spiritual life in ourselves, for according to Ephesians 2.1, we are spiritually dead. For us to become spiritually alive, God must do a miracle. Okay, so let's look at the second part here. We're going to move from that first generation of Isaac, uh, second generation of Isaac, to this third generation of Jacob and Esau. The purpose of God in election. I'll just read that again. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born or having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, 
but of him who calls. So again, they had the same Jewish parents, these two kids. They were Hebrews of the Hebrews, as Paul would describe them. They were Esau, who was the eldest, and Jacob, who was the youngest. They were twins born inside their mom. They had Isaac as a father, Rebecca as a mom. Everything was completely copacetic. But there shouldn't have been anything really different in these two boys that, 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 that as far as bloodline goes, if it's according to the flesh, could you be any more the same? But the point is, in those two, the, the delineation is that God chose the younger over the older. Even that uh, is this, and in the Old Testament, in those times, the older would get all of the inheritance and the younger, of course, would not. James Montgomery Boyce says this, there's nothing to explain this except God's sovereign right to dispose of his dest- of the destinies of human beings as he pleases, entirely apart from any rights thought to belong to us due to our age or other factors. Thirdly, uh, this is the most important point again, is that the choice of Jacob instead of Esau was made before either child, as I said, had the opportunity to do good or evil. So you have to realize it isn't based on the fact that one, because we know it's, it's by grace alone, but it wasn't before one had ever sinned or one had ever done anything good. They were chosen. They were elected. Jacob was elected. He was loved and Esau was hated. That's difficult. That's hard. But, but Paul is bringing this forth in this third generation to drive home the point that God is absolutely sovereign in election. Not just then, but now and always. You know, if, if the problem, and this, is, this is, should be uh, for us that are reformed, that believe in the five points of Calvinism like I do, like this is our text. The Arminians, they get a little squirrely (laughs) reading this stuff because man likes to be the top of everything. We want to know that we are going to determine our own destiny. It's a matter of humility to recognize God chooses, not us. God chooses and puts his love or he rejects and doesn't provide his love. He, He chooses those who will be reprobate. We're going to talk a lot the next couple next week, I think, about dealing with that. Because is there unrighteousness with God? Because that's right front and forward. It just doesn't. That's not fair. Could you imagine if you had two kids, right, and you just started to punish one before they ever did something evil, and you started rewarding one of your children before they did anything good? The kids would be in an uproar. But this is exactly what God does. You know why? God is God, and we are not. He is sovereign in election. This again means that we cannot miss it. That election is not on the basis of anything done by the individual. Never anything good or evil. But the focus there should be that what is the focus? The focus is this, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. What holds sway in time and space is the purposes of the triune God of the Bible. That's what's going to hold sway in what is your destiny? What is your future? It's all bound up in a sovereign God who chooses. It's his purposes. As I kept throwing that out there, you guys are all going to know it. It's the telos of what God has planned and purposed for the future of individuals, of peoples, of nations. That it's by his sovereign choice. There's only one will in all of God's before creation. Only God is perfectly free to do what he wants to do. Man is not. Man is bound to the will of God. And since the fall, we can only choose sin We can't even choose good. We're bent towards sin. So the only hope we have is God. But he alone is sovereign. And it's not of works. So here's the deal. Those that are Arminian, they believe in this thing uh, that went all the way back to Pelagius, that there's a thing called prevenient grace. That God kind of throws out grace to everybody. And 
you can. There's you got a little bit inside you that could reach out to what's good. You know what I mean? You, you, you've got a little good that God provides this pervenient grace for all of mankind, and you hold on to it. But what happens there, once you think there's a pervenient grace that you hung on to, who gets the glory? You get the glory. You start to boast in your faith. But we know that even salvation is by grace through faith. Even your faith is a gift of God. That's the important thing to understand here. As we look at the sovereign election of God, is that our view of God is blown up. We have a gigantic God who is involved in choosing everything. Responsibility, we're going to have responsibility. But that's what got us all, all hyped up and excited about Romans chapter 8, is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Can tribulation or peril or sword or nakedness or persecution? Nothing, because God's got a hold of us. He chose us and he's holding us. But the thing is, the opposite is true. You, you, there's just nothing in you. So there is no prevenient grace. It's completely of God's electing power. So when we saw there in Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for good, and it's actually, I told, this is the NIV, which I love better. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. You know why? Because he first loved us. Because he first elected and placed his love upon us. So it's, again, it's about God's choosing. And I'll bring us back to a little advertisement for our Sunday school, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, Chapter 10, Effectual Call, Paragraph 2, sums this up beautifully. This effectual call flows from God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in those called. Neither does the call arise from any power or action on their part. They are totally passive in it. Do you see what it's Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. That's completely passive and equal. It's God who chooses sovereignly, just like the confession. Uh, paragraph four of the same chapter says this, those who are not elected will not and cannot truly come to Christ and therefore cannot be saved because they are not effectually drawn of the Father. He who began a good work in you is faithful and just to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That good work in you is election. Election happens from before time and space, and then it's strong enough to call you. He'll bring the call. And when the call comes, you know what? You're dead in sins. There's nothing you could do to respond to that call. You just can't. He calls you from darkness to light. He says, boom, and you just, all of a sudden, your desires are different. All of a sudden, you have a heart to hear God. You have a heart to respond to the gospel so that you might truly become children of God. It is the sovereign election of God. John 6, 14, 44 says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Ephesians 1.11, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You don't have to worry that, that life's spiraling out of control. It's all in his sovereign decrees and purposes. That's what I love about being a sovereign grace Christian. Our God is good and strong. He'll do what he said he's going to do. No matter what happens in our lives. According to his counsel, the triune counsel, 2 Timothy 1.9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Why? That it's about the purposes of God according to election, not of works, but of him who calls. Ephesians 2, 1, I'll say it again. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
Jacob and Esau, twin brothers, there was nothing they could do. There was nothing mom and dad could do as much as they tried <laughs> to, to, to give the blessing to Esau and not to, to Jacob. And You read that story, and it's filled with sin and brokenness, and Jacob's a liar and all the craziness. But what keeps them on the path of where they are, God elected Jacob. He would be the patriarch of Israel, through which Judah would come, through down the road through which Christ would come. But it's God's electing power, not of works, thus we should boast. Later in Romans 11:36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. This doctrine makes God who he really is. Huge, infinitely wonderful and great. If we mitigate in any of election, we mitigate who God is, and we have to elevate who we are, which is, is completely wrong, obviously. But now this last point, which is, is more difficult. It's funny because it's difficult, but it's exactly the thing that brought Michelle to Sovereign Grace to understand it. I was like wrestling with these things. I was thinking, what, does that mean we're robots? God made robots? What, what are we, we don't, we'll talk about that. We don't, we don't have any free will of any kind. Um, this doesn't sound like love to me, that God would force me. And so I'm going all over this. And, and finally, it was chapter 9 that opened it up for me. And I kind of, I'm explaining it to Michelle. I'm all excited, just going point for point, And God elects and, and boom, boom, boom. What do you think, honey? She goes, yeah, of course. Jacob, I've loved. Esau, I've hated. I got it. Oh, okay, thanks, sweetie. Great. <laughs> uh, so, but it is so true. It's, it's kind of the crux of this thing. But the difficulty of it is that God sovereignly hates, doesn't choose, passes over. Um, of course, uh, this is a very difficult for our feeble, finite minds to get our head around. But I think, and you'll see in some of the commentaries, they look at that word hates and they say it really means love le loves less. <laughs> Jacob, he loves more. Esau, he loves less. But you really can't get around how it works itself out. Whether he loves him less or loves him more, the word hate kind of applies because he doesn't get all of the blessing, all of the election, all of the... Being chosen is, is part of the, those that would look forward to Christ. It, it's obvious. Esau, I have hated. Some, again, try to, to mitigate that hating. But I agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones, John, John Murray, James Montgomery Boyce, and others that it is a double predestination. Now, again, it's a complete mystery, and we ought not to. Because as we look into this, we like put our thinking caps on. We start to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. It's not going to add up. <laughs> it just doesn't add up. It's a mystery how God does what he does. You know why? He's infinite. We're finite. We just won't get our heads around it. But he provides that for us. And I think one of the biggest thing is when we think about hatred, because we're fallen, our hatred is marred by sin. Our hatred is not according to truth and righteousness and holiness as God's hatred is. Um, John Murray says this, in God's hate, there's no malice, malignancy, vindictiveness, unholy rancor, or bitterness. This hate is the reflection in us of God's jealousy for his own honor. We must therefore recognize that there is in God a holy hate that cannot be defined in terms of not loving or loving less. I think about, we're talking about hate, and so we're at youth group, I'll embarrass Joanne again. Two weeks ago, we're talking about the one another's of the scriptures, and just how in the world, it's so hard, you see no one honoring one another. Parents are no longer honored. The one thing God calls children to do, they don't honor their moms and dads. And we're talking about these one another's, I said, Joanna, uh, why do you think it's so hard for us to honor one another? She said, because people are terrible. <laughs> And I said, yeah, well, that's pretty much it. We are broken. We are fallen. We are sinful. God is not. God is perfect. God is holy. God is just. And he, what he does here, whether you understand it or not, we have to, at the end of the day, say, you know what? God is God. And later he'll say in Romans, 
Who are you? We're the pot. He's the potter. Who should we tell him what to do? We have to say, God, open my heart so I can understand this very difficult doctrine. James Montgomery Boyce says this, reprobation, the doctrine that God rejects and repudiates some persons to eternal condemnation. It's impossible to study election without also dealing with this negative counterpart. It's impossible to have election, the positive side of predestination, without having reprobation, which is the negative side. And this was a real part of who we are as reformed. I go back to John Kelvin who said, election cannot stand except and set over against reprobation. Now listen, there's a big conversation to have scripturally how this shakes out. And we're going to talk next week because Paul's going to go a little further. He's going to say, is there unrighteousness with God? What do you guys think the answer is? Is there unrighteousness with God? Absolutely not. And he's going to give us some good reasons why. But today I want to set the firm foundation of absolute sovereign election in the lives of men and women and children. Uh, Proverbs says this, Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. In John 12, 39 to 40, Therefore, they could not believe that first century Jews, because Isaiah, Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and lest, excuse me, they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Uh, John 13, 18, uh, speaking about Judas here, I believe. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. While I was with them in the world, I kept them, John 17, 12. I kept them in your name. Those who you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. Uh, and then finally in Jude 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. There is those that are chosen, elected to salvation. There are those that I believe there's a double choice because they're passed over. And we'll talk about how we can kind of justify and think this through. But, but the doctrine of sovereign election, I think, is very clear. It may, not, it may make us uncomfortable, Again, but God is God. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. James Montgomery Boyce says this about Romans 9. Romans 9 is that this is entirely apart from any supposed right of birth or good works. It is due entirely to the will and mercy of God's sovereignty. But election means that salvation is of God. It is his idea and his work, and therefore it is as solid as God himself is. It's a real determining factor of who our God is. How big is your God? If your God is capital G God, he's an electing God. He is a foreknowing. He is a God who is working his purposes and decrees out in time and in space and calling men and women and passing over others. But it doesn't mean that God is the author of evil. Man is still responsible for his own sin. Like we said earlier, no one is going to get injustice. Those that are passed over are going to get what they deserve. They're fallen. They're in sin. They get justice. Those who come to the gospel, those who come to Christ, they get mercy because God chose them from before the foundations of the earth. That should give us First of all, real confidence, as we saw, that God will not let us go. It's not that now we have to hold on to God as strong as we can. His grip is impenetrable. He holds us fast, and he will take us all the way. I think Charles Hodge says something very wonderful before I close that will kind of begin to give us an idea of what we're going to look at next week. There's nothing in the exercise of this sovereignty inconsistent with either justice or mercy. 
God only punishes the wicked for their sins while he extends undeserved mercy to the objects of his grace. There is no injustice done to the one wicked man in the pardon of another, especially as there are the highest objects to be accomplished both in the punishment of the vessels of wrath and the pardon of the vessels of mercy. God does does nothing more than exercise a right inherent inside in his sovereignty, that of dispensing pardon and pleasure. Our God is almighty. Our God is all-powerful. Our God is all-knowing. And he chooses. And whom he chooses, if you're a chosen one, it ought to elicit love for your father who has loved you so and done everything necessary. What it'll elicit in people that are passed over, those are the ones shaking their fist at God, you know? Those are the ones that don't want to have anything to do with him. But it's not God's doing, it's their doing. So just in closing, before we come up here, we have to recognize that God must elect and call or no one would come because why? Man is totally depraved. Paul made that so clear in Romans chapter three. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. We're powerless and under the power and the sway of sin. You could never come to God by any works of your own. It's only God's electing love and power that chooses some. We saw in Romans chapter 2 that all of the Jews, or Romans 1, all the Gentiles are sinners and guilty. Romans 2, all the Jews are sinners and guilty, whether they are of the tribe and lineage of Abraham and Isaac. It's going to be the spiritual children that come, those that God chooses. How could a creature as depraved as that possibly come to God unless God should first set his saving choice upon him, regenerate him, and then call him to faith? How could a sinner like that believe the gospel unless God should first determine that he or she should believe it and then actually enable him to believe and to come? James Montgomery Boyce, it's just what I'm saying here. So again, we can get excited about he who foreknew and predestined and, and who is conforming us and, and, and going to carry us right through to glorification, but it's always and ever going to be a work of sovereignty, a work of our God who is sovereign in everything. And in particular, your call to mercy and to grace. So let's come forward and we'll sing our last song. I, I chose this song, Not In Me, because it is not in me, not in you, that we find any type of mercy. And ultimately, what all of the Old Testament and all of those structures were towards was Christ who would come to be the fulfillment that we trust in. Let's stand. <clears throat>